Every Sunday night, we're studying the book of Revelation. And uh, this book is probably the most misconstrued book in the Bible. Everybody thinks it's about horrible, scary things at the end of time and and how these are all nuclear warheads and and how it's all about... Uh, uh, about something scary, the end of time. And that's not what it's about at all. It's, uh, it's amazing to me how off base all these great so-called scholars are. Before we go into the book, I'm reading to you, trying to share with you uh, some of the facts and customs about the first century. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this tonight. I'm just going to read you a, a few facts Come back later because I've got a lot of things to say about the church at Thyatira. We're going to try to end that. I may not be able to end it tonight, which is the fourth church in the second chapter of Revelation. Uh, I'm talking to you. I'm trying to give you a little mini lesson on the culture of Israel in the first century. They lived in a world dominated by Romans. The Roman Caesars ruled the world. And they, and they had a Greek culture that had been left over and kept in the Roman world by the Greeks in the 4th century B.C. when Alexander the Great was ruling. He had this simple little nation called Israel. Very common people. Uh, they, they, were, they were on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea here. And just a small tract of land, uh, smaller than New Jersey. I don't even, sometimes it amazes me how it's just a, few, a little over 100 miles or so from one end of it to the other. It's very narrow in places, 30, 40 miles, just a little bitty piece of land. And how could all of the world be looking at this? And what really amazes me is how can they defend themselves Against all of the world, especially all these Arabs over here. And there's only about a little over four million people in Israel today. And yet they are a world nuclear power. It's like Mighty Mouse sitting right in the middle of all these cats around them. That's what it's like. Remember Mighty Mouse and, he'd, and all these cats would come in and he'd be throwing them every direction. Well, that's what they're like. That's what Israel is like. It, it's just completely out of proportion to their numbers and for all that they've gone through through all these years. And a lot of people say, well, that's not the miracle of God and literal Israel don't count. It's only spiritual Israel. We're going to go into that you know, on our Sunday morning series that I'm teaching. But they, they were a simple land with simple people. They had very simple vocations. We went through some of those vocations like shepherding and carpentering and... and uh, we went through, uh, uh, I'm still going through uh, the works of the potter on Wednesday night. And I'm, I'm going to finish up reading to you. Yeah, that is good. Isn't it? And about the hunters and the hunting, we went through the first hunter in scripture was Nimrod, but he was a hunter of men and how they hunted to protect sheep. They would go and track the bears and the lions and particularly the, they would track the wolves the wolves are, were the most dangerous things to a flock of sheep. Uh, the, uh, the writers tell us that a pack of wolves will destroy an entire flock in the middle of the night. If a bear comes in, he'll take away a lamb or he'll take away one of the ewes. Uh, if a lion comes in, he may kill one or two at the most. Take five in a pack of wolves, they'll kill a hundred sheep in one night just to be killing them. <laughs> they'll destroy an entire flock. That's why false teachers are called ravening wolves of the evening because they would come in in the evening when the shepherd would bed down the sheep and they would just devastate a flock. We talked about how animals were killed for food and, and the fowl were killed for meat <coughs> and the methods of the hunters, how they killed. Some used pits. They used all kinds of weapons. And there were hideouts for wild animals. Let me read a little bit to you about this. I'm reading out of Mr. White's book, Manners and Customs of the Bible. Hideouts for wild animals. Palestine and Syria have their hideouts for wild animals and fowl. 
Wild beasts have lived in the wild parts of the Lebanon mountains. And that's, of course, Lebanon is directly above Israel. That's the old land of Phoenicia or the land of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon are the same as Phoenicia. Uh, to the north of the Holy Land through the years. But this was more the source of these animals for Syria, Syria rather than for the main part of Palestine itself. The marshes immediately north of Lake Muron have through the centuries been the haunt of many waterfowl and the reeds thereby have provided lairs for various animals, especially wild buffalo. When Herod the Great was a young man, he used to come here to hunt game. Today, the Jews are busy draining much of this swampland that it may be used for agricultural purposes. The principal hideout for wild animals that bother the citizens of Palestine, and especially Judea and Samaria, is the Zohar of the Jordan Valley. And you remember, I might just point out something to you. You remember when, uh, when uh, uh, Samson killed, when Samson slew a lion... Uh, with his hands, you remember that? The African lion is not what it's talking about. They didn't have the African lion with the big mane there. Anytime you see a picture drawn and it's that, it's that African lion, that's not true. It's, uh, that's just like the, the Lord's Supper. Everybody sitting on one side of the table. That's not true either. Uh, they had a lion. It was probably more like a cougar, something like that. That's what he killed with his hands. Um, unless God gave a man super strength, killing one of those African lions is going to be a job. Uh, the Jordan Valley between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea is called by the Arabs the Gore, G-H-O-R, or that is to say the Rift. Within the Gore is a narrow and deep valley called the Zor, Z-O-R, in the center of which the river flows. For much of this distance, the Zor is a jungle of tropical plants, shrubs, and trees. It is thus a hideout for all kinds of wild animals. During the part of the year when the river overflows, the wild beasts are driven from their haunts, but return there when the river recedes. Most of the wild animals that have raided the habitable parts of Palestine through its history have come from these haunts in the Jordan Valley. Thus, Jeremiah says, Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the swelling of the Jordan that's what that's talking about. The swelling of the Jordan is when the, is when the banks overflow and uh, it comes up into that low land. The scene of the temptation of Jesus was doubtless the wilderness of Judea. Mark says of Jesus, and he was with the wild beasts in Mark 1 and 13. Quite pro probably most of these animals had come up from Zor, which was near at hand. And that's all I'm going to go through tonight. I've got some more to say about the wild beast, but I'm going to go into that later. And I'd like to just share a little bit about the culture and the customs of the first century Jew. Now, we're in the book of Revelation. Turn back over to Revelation, the first chapter. Revelation, the first chapter is, I keep saying that it is a glossary for the entire book. Of course, the word glossary is a Greek word. It comes from, it is the word glossa. Glossa uh, is the Greek word foreign language, foreign language, and, and a glossary is a section of a book where that you turn to to find words that are foreign to the average reader so you can understand. If you understand Revelation, the first chapter and what it's about, you'll understand most of the book as we go through it. But first of all, you have to understand this is a Jewish book. And it's about Jews. I mean, you got the seven candlesticks right in the front of it. You got the seven stars. And the seven stars, that was the Pleiades of the Old Testament. That was the, that was the, that's the, that's the original seven stars. And you have the, uh, and, and that's mentioned all through the Old Testament. Uh, over there in Amos, the fifth chapter, uh, Amos speaks of, Seeking him that makes the seven stars in Orion are the Pleiades. You've got the seven churches in verse 4. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And let me not begin revelation without putting the definition on the board. There may be somebody that's watching a tape for the first time or hearing it on uh, through this microphone 
The word revelation, apocalypsis, apokalupsis, and of course it comes from apocalypto, and apocalypto is the word revealed. God reveals himself to who he wills to reveal himself, and it comes from apo, meaning a removal of the calypto, and that word is cover. God's going to remove the cover to his elect family. No one else is going to see the truth about this book unless they're elect of God. Now, you have to understand the meaning of this word. And God reveals this book. I don't think I've said it this way. God reveals this book through the number seven. That's how God reveals this book. The whole book is revealed through that. Of course, you have to define the words. People say, how do you study Revelation and get so much out of it? When I go to a verse, I don't just give some, I don't just read a commentary and say, oh, this guy said this. Uh, people say, can you give me an easy answer about how to study the Bible? There's no such thing. Uh, I may take a verse, look up every word in the verse, take my concordance, uh, look up that word, everywhere it's mentioned in the concordance, and then go through and pick out special places and go to the Old Testament and take all of those verses and look through them and define all the words there and look at the culture and pull out some of my encyclopedias and take the, the, the particular custom over here and pull out an encyclopedia and pull out this encyclopedia out of my library and out of this encyclopedia and pull these commentaries out and pull this custom out and take Mr. Edersheim and Mr. Diceman, Mr. Saltall and pull all these books and I'm going looking through them. That's the only way to study. You have to research. And when you look and look and look and look and look and look and look, you'll find some answers. So I don't merely take, this is not, Jim Brown sure is brilliant. Boy, he knows so much. And he just sees it out of the clear blue sky. No, I don't. I study my brains out. Till my brain is fried. I'm going, Ugh. and then I just keep on. I used to study when I was teaching at the house. I'd study all night long looking for that special thing to give to somebody the next morning. I'd just be digging through and I'd be sleepy and it'd be wintertime and I'd, my head's falling down on the table and I'd, and I would get up, I'd take my shoes off, and I'd take my socks off, and I'd walk outside in 15 degrees or 10 degrees, wake myself up, come back in, and start again. And when I started to fall over, and I'd go into the refrigerator and get something out, eat it, and that would wake me up. Then I'd go back outside in the cold and wake myself up. Sometimes, if you're really hungry and you really want to find the truth, you'll make any kind of sacrifice possible to find it. Don't think that I just read this, and God, boy, he just gets hold of that real quick. Huh? <laughs> you thought so. It takes a lot of evaluating, a lot of thinking, a lot of studying, a lot of meditating, a lot of running these things through your mind around the clock year after year after year after year after year. This is not something that's easy. I'm not saying that in boast. I'm saying you have to study. And if you, if you don't have time to study in your housewife, if you'll come here, I'll study it for you and lay it in front of you. That's all you have to do. Well, it may be a gift a lot to a degree, but I have one thing I've got more than anything else, and that's perseverance. I will I'll dig and dig. And I want you to learn that. Don't think because you sit down and study for 30 minutes, well, gosh, I can't find the answer to this. Well, keep studying it for about 10 years, and you will learn something. Now, now we got the seven candlesticks in verse, uh, the seven churches in, in verse 11. Seven candlesticks, 12 and 13. Seven stars in verse 16. And when I think of the seven stars, this is what I think of right there. The seven stars comes to my mind. I don't think of the star of David. When you look at it from the top, if these arms were equal, it'll form the star of David. And I think of, boy, all this stuff goes through my mind. When I see this, I think of the tree of life. When I see this, I think of my mother, Jerusalem. And it goes on and on and on. And we may just put something on the board tonight I'd like for you to see concerning this and the tree of life in Jerusalem. 
because God has given us an abstract book that we can understand if we think in the proper direction. Now, we find, I keep saying, verse 20, chapter 1. This is the revealing verse of the whole book. Chapter 1, verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars in the right hand of Christ. From verse 16. Which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, which you see in 12 and 13. Here's the mystery. Of the word mystery is musturian. M-U-S. T-E-R-I-O-N. He's saying, here is the mystery. I'm going to uncover the mystery. I'm going to pull the cover off of the mystery. That's what he's saying. And when he says the mystery, here it is. Here is the mystery. (coughs) These seven stars are the seven angels of these seven churches. There's the mystery. Gosh, he's saying that I've got the key to Revelation The mystery is the seven stars are the seven angels. There are seven stars, so there's seven angels. The Pleiades was seven stars. We're going to go into that. Of the seven churches, here is the mystery. He's saying, I'm taking the cover off for you through the book. And these seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Well, let me write this on the board. Candlesticks. Let me erase this. And these are some things that we're going to see. Candlesticks. Seven candlesticks are equals seven churches. And may I keep reminding you, seven, you got to define seven, seven. Since the seven candlesticks, we find them in Exodus, the 25th chapter. I think that's Jewish, isn't it? I think that comes out of the law, doesn't it? That's Jewish. So let's take the Jewish meaning of the number seven, which is the word Sheba. It comes from the word Shaba. Shaba, which means to complete. It means to take an oath to God, to promise God you'll serve him. That's what it means. Well, we don't do that when we first come to a knowledge of Christ. It means to seven oneself, seven oneself. And we add seven things to our faith in 2 Peter 1 and and, uh, 5. And it means to complete or to be completed, to be completed. And God constantly speaks of sevens all through the Bible. And he tells Israel, I'll punish you seven times for your sin. Says that four times. In Leviticus, the 26th chapter. So, in a, so the seven candlesticks equals the seven church. Now, the candlesticks had what they call knops and blossoms on it. What are blossoms? What are blossoms? Flowers. And, and usually if you have blossoms on a tree... It brings fruit, doesn't it? So this is a fruit tree is what it is. That's uh, the seven candlesticks is a fruit tree. And everywhere you find fruit, everywhere you find fruit, tree of life, all this is equal, isn't it? Tree of life. And the seven, the seven stars Seven stars, the original seven stars. Now, we see seven stars in the right hand of Jesus. The reason I'm bringing this up is because the one who overcomes, the last part, well, let me get back to that and I'll come back here. The seven stars, the original seven stars is the Pleiades. And what did the Pleiades bring forth according to the rabbis? Fruit. Didn't they? Huh? And the tree of life brings forth fruit. And the tree of life, oh goodness, let me get back to that in a minute. Boy, that's going to take me off too quick. Now, the second and third chapter of Revelation, this is what I call a, it's an introduction into the rest of the book. 
The whole book is about the church being sevened. And being sevened means to go through the trials. When we're completed, we go through the fiery trials of life and we add to our faith. It's what we do. When we are sevened. So sevened, being seven has to do with adding to our faith, doesn't it? It has to do with faith increasing, doesn't it? And faith is death to self, isn't it? Death to self. And death to self, how does it come about? Do you know what the cross was called in the pagan world, in the ancient pagan world? The cross was called the tree of life. And when we die to self, the tree of life produces fruit in our life, doesn't it? Isn't that amazing? It's just amazing how God goes and flows all this together. That's right. Death to self, the cross. Let me read that to you because that's what, well, let me go ahead. I'll come right back to that. Let's get down here to Thyatira. We've always gone, already gone through Ephesus. We've gone through uh, Smyrna. We've gone through Pergamos. And I'm trying to continue on Thyatira. Let's go down here to verse 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, Thyatira, and charity, your agape, walking in God's commandment, and service, and faith, and thy patience. You've got a lot of commendation, Thyatira, and thy works in the last to be more than the first. You're actually walking in all these things now more than you were when you first come to a knowledge of Christ. Notwithstanding. However, I have a few things against thee because you're allowing something to go on in the church. I've already covered this. I'm not going to cover this again. I'm just going to read it. We've been on this very verse for the last six weeks, I guess. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess. That's not talking about a woman at Thyatira named Jezebel. It's the Jezebel of the Old Testament. And her works are being produced here at Thyatira. To teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave Jezebel space to repent. I gave her 15 years from Naboth until Jehu who came to kill her. And she didn't repent. And she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her in great tribulation. What was Jezebel's problem? What was her downfall? She brought idolatry into Israel. And when you're talking about idolatry, you're talking about spiritual fornication or harlotry. And that's idolatry. Except they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death. And, she, and God certainly did kill literal Jezebel's children. But he's not talking just about that. He's talking about her spiritual children. All those in Israel that followed her when she married Ahab and brought the Baal and the grove worship into Israel. And then her wicked daughter Athaliah comes down and marries Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat. And she brings all this system to southern Judah. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins, the nephros, N-E-P-H-R-O-S, N-E-P-H-R-O-S. The reins are the innermost mind. I am he that searcheth the innermost mind and the hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. This is not works for salvation. It is God that works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. He that hath begun a good work in you, he will do the performing of it. And any good that we do is not us. Therefore, we're not going to get these big gold crowns with jewels and diamonds in it in heaven. The word crown is the word Stephanos. S-T-E, 
P-H-A-N-O-S, when it speaks of the church getting, getting crowns, when it speaks of Jesus having crowns, it is diadem. A diadem is the one that's the decorative crown of a ruler. The Stephanos, we get the name Stephen or Stephanie from that. That was an oak leaf that they got when they ran the races. It was a corruptible crown. Now, let's get on with Thyatira. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. What did they have already? Well, he's talking about verse 19. I know thy works, charity, service, faith, patience. I know these things. Hold fast to that. Then he says in verse 26, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Of course, the word overcometh. Remember the word? N-I-K-A-I-O-O. N-I-K-A-I-O-O. Nikaio. And that is the verb. In the Greek, you have a noun. And the noun form is N-I-K-E. And that word Nike, we would say Nike. But it's the word Nike. Nike was one of the gods of the ancient world. I believe it was the son of Athena. She held him in her hand. And Nike, that was the god of victory. That is the word victory. Paul and John, they're using the culture of the day. The word Nike is victory. Well, if you wear Nike shoes, you're supposed to be able to outrun everybody else. Sure you are. Uh, go over here to, to, to 1 John. Here is the victory. 1 John. <coughs> 1 John. <coughs> Y'all excuse me. 1 John 5. <coughs> Verse 4. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. Well, wait a minute. What does he say over there? He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. There in verse 26. Well, who is going to overcome? The one who is born of God. Born of God or born again. Again is the word A-N-O-T-H-E-N in the Greek. It comes from ano, meaning above. And the root word is A-N-T-I, anti. And anti means in opposition to. But your overcoming is not something you're going to do. It means instead of. That is a birth that comes from God. When he says, he that overcometh, he's saying, the one that I birth into the kingdom as one of my predestinated elect will overcome. And of course, Look here in verse 4 of chapter 5, 1 John. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. That's the new birth. Are we born of our will? No, John 1, 13. We're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So the man that's born of God, it's not by his will. And when he overcomes, it's not by his will. He overcomes by the will of God, doesn't he? Because he's born again. So Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, the Nike, that overcometh the world. The Nikaio, the word victory is Nike. And the word overcometh is Nikaio, the verb form. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So wherever you see overcome, you think faith. I'm not going to go into faith other than faith cometh by hearing. Hear and obey are the same word. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And of course, substance, hupo, uh, substance is hypostasis. It means to under, 
stand. Well, how do we understand? Well, we become mathetes. A disciple, that's the word mathetes, is a learner. And you cannot be my disciple, Jesus said, unless you take your cross and die daily. So when we take our cross and die, we understand. And the cross is the tree of life. That's death to self. That adds to our faith. And that's when we are sevened. Aren't we? And notice how all this goes together. It's all a mathematical equation. Now, let's go back over. Well, look over here at John 16, 33. Here's Jesus' words. John 16. I'll give you this. Let's get back over here. John 16. I wish I could teach all this to you fast, but I can't. Somebody said this morning, won't you go faster? I can't. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you, this is Jesus, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. What he's saying is, I have overcome the world in you. Well, how do we get over the world? The world is offering us all the things of the flesh, and we can't fulfill the flesh. And Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, the man that loves silver, he that loveth silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. When goods are increased, they are increased that eat them. How do you get over that desire for the stuff and the things of the world and the things of the flesh? How do you get over it? You die to it by faith. You believe God and you say, God, I don't have to have all these things. You will take care of me. But we really don't believe that when we hold on to our money and our things and our stuff we don't give to God what's rightfully his. We don't tithe. We don't give offerings. We're afraid we're going to let go of our money. We're afraid we're going to let go of too much of our time. Well, I don't have time to go down and help at the church. I don't have time to go over and do this. I don't have time to help Jim and Mary. Just my life is so full of me. I guarantee you, when you let go of all of that, it will produce, the cross will produce fruit in your life. That's what it'll do. Now, and I believe this is a picture here of the fruit tree. That's what the seven candlesticks are. Now, I'll show you that in a minute. Now, let's go back over here to verse 26. Now, the man that overcomes is the man that's born of God, isn't he? Isn't that amazing? You can read here in Revelation and go back to the Gospels and talk about overcoming. And Jesus said, it'll be me that does that in you. And I'm the one that'll be working in you. Now, here's the man. Here's what the man gets when he overcomes. He that overcometh by faith and keepeth my works unto the end. Well, how are we going to do that? We're not. It's going to be God doing it in us. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. The scripture tells us over and over. Endures the word hupomeno, H-U-P-O-M-E-N-O. Hupomeno. It means, meno means to continue in and under the trials. This word hupomeno, that is the verb and the noun is the word hupomone. And that word hupomone is the word patience. And the trying of your faith works patience. Hupomeno means to continue in the fire. Endure does not mean he that holds out until the end without getting lost and without falling out of salvation. Boy, the church of Christ loved that verse. He that endures the end. You got to endure. You got to hold out without getting lost. It's not what that's talking about. It's talking about the man that stays in the fire. Who's going to see to it that we're put in the fire and stay there? God. He that overcometh, verse 26, and keepeth my works unto the end to him... Will I give power over the nations? He's not talking about during a so-called millennium. We don't believe that here. We believe we're in it now. Guys, I hate to go into that because there's no thousand. The word is not thousand. It's the word kill it. It's plural. It means 2,000 or more. And we're in the millennium now. Not millennium. Millennium means mill and annum. And it means 1,000 and and. It, well, I don't have time to go there. I'm sorry. Stop right here. It takes me all 
night to do that. I got a, I got a tape that's really, really good. It's called Revelation, the Beginning and Ending of Kilia. C-H-I-L-I-A. And it shows you, doubtless, that Kilia is the word thousand. It actually, it's not the word thousand. It's been mistranslated. It's 2,000 or more. It's the last 2,000 years of time. It's the time period of God revealing himself, as John said, things that will be shortly and hereafter. It's the time period of the church. That's what it is, and we're in that right now. That's the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said the kingdom of God is in you. Uh, yeah, we're close. Yep, I believe we're headed towards it. Now, the man that overcometh at Thyatira, he's saying, retain the works that you were in. He said, I'll give you power over the nations. He's talking about the man that has faith overcomes. That's the victory. How can this be in a time period after when it's faith is the victory that overcomes the world he says i'm going to give you power over the nations when we rule we're ruling right now in the kingdom of god aren't we priests and kings isn't don't we give our bodies a living sacrifice that's what priests do don't kings judge righteous judgment as long as the kings of israel were judging righteously when israel is a nation for first samuel and second chronicles As long as they were judging righteously, God kept them on the throne. Do we have a king living in us? Well, sure we do. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the kingdom of God is in us. Luke 17, 20 and 21. The kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, they were both one and the same. And that was an old title for Israel. And we're spiritual Israel. That's the church. That's the kingdom of God. And how do we rule? With Rabdos, look at it right here, the next verse. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. The word rod is the word Rabdos. That is a rod for ruling, and it's the same word, Hebrews 1 and 8. Look at Hebrews 1 and 8. Here's how we rule. Hebrews 1 verse 8. We're ruling right now in the kingdom. It's real easy to rule people. I don't know if y'all know this. Here is the rod right here. This will rule people. It will make them run away from you. It's called the word of God. And it will break them in pieces is what it will do. Gosh, when we get into breaking pieces, that's another whole subject. It will scatter them abroad. Look over here in Hebrews 1 and 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. What was the throne of God in the Old Testament Israel? The Ark of the Covenant. He came and sat down on it on the mercy seat and he ruled Israel from there. And in 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, Samuel said, You wanted a king to rule over you when God was your king. He says, so therefore, where is God sitting now? When the handwriting of ordinances were blotted out, what throne does he sit on right now? Our hearts. That's his throne. That's where he rules from. When we rule with a rod that breaks the nations and shivers, we're ruling them right now. We rule with a scepter of righteousness. Is the scepter of thy kingdom. What kingdom? Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Let me just give this to you. I've said it to you. Uh, The word righteousness is euthetes, E-U-T-H-E-T-E-S, E-U-T-H-E-T-E-S. It means rectitude or what is equitable, what is right. Where do we find out what is right? Right here. This is what we rule people with. You say, Jim... I don't understand. How do you rule people with the word of God? You don't rule them if you don't know anything about it. If you don't study this and learn it, that's why you need to learn the Greek words, learn the verses, find out where they are, listen to my tapes, copy the the verses down, copy the words down, take them home, study them. If you'll listen to my tapes over and over and over every day, 
A lot of these words will become second nature where you're able to. And when you get in the middle of a crowd, you say, no, that's wrong. And that's wrong. And that's wrong. Listen to me a minute. Hold on a second. I'll get to you. And you're able to do that. And that actually rules people. Where did I start to take you to? Oh, oh, no, I was going to show you something else. This word, here's how we rule. We rule with the scepter of righteousness. I'm going to show you this. This word righteousness is a construction. I mean, this word righteousness, euthetes, this is the scepter or the rabdos we rule with. It is a construction of the word you, E-U. That word E-U means well or good. When you see that word E-U, L-O-G-Y, eulogy, it comes from E-U, meaning well, and logos, meaning words. When a man gives a eulogy, he stands up and says good words about the guy, doesn't he? Says well words about him. Well, this word, this word you means well. Here's, this is what we rule people with. You and T-I-T-H-E-M-I. Remember that word? Tithemai? Means to level passively in a horizontal posture. Horizontal. Here's how you rule. When you bow to God and get on your face before God like this. And you get face down before God in front of the world. You're not humbling yourself to the world. You're humbling yourself to God. When you bow to God, you don't, you don't go to Kmart and get down on you, literally on the floor. When you're bowing to God, you start telling people the truth. But you have to learn the rabdos to do it. I'll give you an illustration. I used to give me a headache. When I was in real estate, I gave these people headaches real bad. I mean, I would just boom, just shoot them, just shoot at them every time I got a chance. And when I come into a room or go into a real estate office, man, they oh, God, here he comes. You think that's not ruling them? When I'd walk into one real estate office, they thought they acted like a king's coming. What do you do when the king, what do you do when the mayor walks in and you're real nervous and you work for him, you're down on the bottom of the ladder? Let me go hide from this guy. Oh, God. It was one fellow that was, and I've told this story years ago. I don't know. I hadn't told it in a long time. He was an old retired Marine sergeant. He cussed like a sailor and just said some stupid things to me. And he said, uh, he said some stupid things scripturally. He didn't know that because he was an old retired Marine. And he said, well, if I ever, if I ever start believing God, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll become a Catholic. He said, and I'll take my chances with God when I get to, uh, get to heaven. I said, you sure will, and you don't have any. And he got to where that I'd just fire at him real quick. And I went into an office where he was. And boy, this really, this is how you rule people. And I knew if I didn't say something to him first, he'd come after me. And he'd come out. And if you've been in real estate offices, this is a fancy real estate office where they had all of these plastic women sitting on the couch waiting to take their clients out. They just dressed up to the hilt, fit to kill, you know. And, uh, and I was always just boom, boom, shooting at people. And he'd come out and he was trying to show off in front of these women. And I knew what he was doing. Ah, oh, he said, boy, I feel good today. I feel great. I feel, and I said, I said, oh, well, you must have Jesus in your heart. Boy, don't say Jesus in front of a bunch of plastic women. Good old man. Oh. And it just drove him crazy. And the only thing he knew to do was start cussing. He said, no, nah, blankety, 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 blankety. And I said, well, I can tell you, you don't have Jesus in your heart. Oh, what's coming out of your mouth? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. He said, I have to go. <laughs> if you learn what to say, you'll rule the world with the rabdos. And one woman said, I said, uh, this one woman used to run a bar out in Arizona. And she was a real estate agent. And she was about this big and about this, looked like, Big truck driver, you know, she could whip any real estate agent in the house, and she could. And uh, one day she said, uh, she said, uh, 
this damn pencil won't write. I said, well, I knew that God damned souls, but in no damned pencil. She said, don't you start on me. I got up in her face and I said, if you won't start, I won't start. So if you know the word of God, don't. <laughs> when somebody cusses in front of you, define it for them. Damn, that's called a crino. God damns people to hell when they don't repent. If you learn enough of the word, you will rule the world. That's what Jesus is talking about. Paul ruled wherever he went. And you don't, you don't have to let anybody bully you around with a bunch of garbage doctrine and theology. I had a fellow at the... I used to work out at a gym here before I had my heart attack and had to quit. And... and uh, Big, wise, smart aleck. I'm trying to show you how you rule the world. Just a cocky, arrogant power lifter. You know, he bench pressed 475 pounds or something. Just, and just, and he come up one day and said, Hey, Brown, is the word S in the Bible? He used the S word. That's a really good word. Let me tell you about that. You know what Paul said? Paul said, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I said, over in the third, man, I went, boom. I said, Paul said, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He said, I was <laughs> circumcised the eighth day of Israel. He said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. There's no greater honor than to be in the tribe of Benjamin with southern Judah. Out of Judah would come the king. And I said, <coughs> Paul said, I count all of these but dung. I said, the word is scubalon. Paul said, all of our accomplishments in this world are dung. And he's going... I said, that's a real good word. If you get any more of those words, bring them back to me. I like those words. And you know what? He was so nice to me from then on. He would, uh, hi, Jim. He didn't want me defining any more words at all. That's how you rule the world. You will make this big power lifter just backed off. He was going like somebody had a shillelagh after him, beating him with it. That's what the Bible's talking about. But you can't rule when you're baby believer and you don't know what this word means. You want to rule? You want to make men back off? You want to make them run from you? Learn the book. And that's what I try to encourage people. That's what Jesus is talking about. When we bow, when we have a well leveling to God, if you have a well leveling, you bow to his will, you study the word, and you become unafraid of the world. Gosh, I've got so many illustrations. I had a guy walk up to me. had a real estate agent when I was in real estate, and we were down here at Ace Hardware. And this guy comes after me all the time. And he knew better than that. He's always cussing in front of me. And he said, hey, Jim, I was listening to you on the radio the other day. How in the hell do you learn all those things? I said, well, Bill, I don't learn them in hell. What I do is I go home, and I study all night long. And he's going, and he knew you dare do that to me, I'll get you. Just get up there to the checkout counter. And he got up to the checkout counter. I got up there with him. I just started talking real loud about God and death, the self and daily cross. And he's going hiding. They want to run away from you. That's what the Bible is talking about. You will actually rule them. We, the kingdom of God is in us. The king lives in us. Learn this book. And the people will run like a scalded dog when you walk in the room when they know that you're going, that you're on the prowl looking for evil. You don't have to beat them up. You say, no, that's not true. I don't learn these things in hell. I mean, just go boom like that. Answer it obviously. Don't try to think up some tricky thing. What they ask you, answer it. They, they, I tell people, I need to make a list of all of the dirty curse words that men use. Every one of them. And then give you the words, give you the scriptures where they are. And say, that's a good word. I like that. And then define it for them. That's how you rule. That's what he's talking. Let's go back here. He shall, verse 27. He shall rule them with a rabdos of iron. That's the word of God. As the vessels of a potter, shall they be broken to shivers? You want to break somebody to pieces, just know more of the word of God and have more answers than they've got questions. Reminds me of 
Israel is the church, isn't it? Look over here in Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah. Now, this rod here, this rabdos, it's the same thing as a, as a battle club. It's a fighting club is what it is. Look here, Jeremiah 50, 50th chapter, I believe it is. And this is what God says. Now, who is Israel now? We're Israel, aren't we? Yeah. Let's go up here to 51 verse 19. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the former of all things. Israel is the rod of his inheritance. This rod here is a battle club. It's the same thing as the Rabdas. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war, Israel, church. For with thee will I break in pieces, the same words he's using over there, in verse 27, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter, thou shall they be broken to shivers. I will break in pieces the nations with thee, Israel, church. What does he say? I will break in pieces the nations. Remember the words of Revelation 2 and 27. Uh, he says, or 2 and 26. And to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. The nations shall be broken to shivers. It's the same thing he's saying about Israel in the Old Testament. In chapter 51, he says, Will I break in pieces the nations and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. And with us he will destroy the kingdoms of this world. And with thee will I break in pieces the horse and the rider. In the Old Testament, it was literal Israel. Now it's spiritual Israel. They were literal kingdoms. They were breaking. Now it is the kingdoms of this world, all the evil in it, the kingdoms of darkness, that we break in pieces with the word of God. All of this is abstract. It's idiomatic terminology. Let's continue reading. And with thee will I break in pieces the chariot and his rider. With thee will I break in pieces man and woman. Break in pieces is the same thing he's saying over there. To break into shivers in verse 27 of chapter 2. And with thee will I break in pieces old and young. And with thee will I break in pieces the young man and the maid. And I will break in pieces with thee the shepherd and his flock. And with thee will I break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen. And with thee will I break in pieces captains and rulers. And I will render unto Babylon to all the inhabitants of the Chaldea. This is the destruction of Babylon in the 51st chapter. This is the destruction of the literal nations of the world. And in the New Testament, we break in pieces with the word of God. To all the inhabitants of Chaldea, all their evil that they have done in Zion, in your sight, saith the Lord, behold, I am against the old destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroys all the earth. Babylon mothered all idolatry upon pride, or let us make us a name. And God is talking about breaking Babylon in pieces. And Babylon is what we live in when we live in the flesh, isn't it? We break in pieces the flesh, and we scatter abroad this flesh. And I will stretch out mine hand upon thee, and roll thee down from the rocks, and will make thee a burnt mountain. We see the burning of that mountain in Revelation 8 and Revelation the 18th chapter. Now let's go back over here to Revelation the second chapter. You can't teach, you have to go into this. All your answers are in the Old Testament, aren't they? They're all over there. All right. In verse 28. The man that overcomes by faith, and it'll be Christ overcoming in us, and the faith is the victory that overcomes the world. The man that has faith... I will give to him the morning star. Huh? Well, that's what it is. Let's read the rest of it. He that hath an ear to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let him hear what the Spirit saith. Morning star. Morning star. Now, you have a convolution throughout the Scriptures. He's telling Thyatira, the man that overcomes by faith, 
And faith will grow when we add to our faith. That's when we will be sevened, right? So when we're sevened adding to our faith, that's the victory that overcomes the world. And the more faith we have, the more word of God we have, the more we learn the truth, the more we overcome. Now we're talking about morning star. There's a convolution of morning star because in mythology, mythology, they tell us that the morning star comes out in the springtime, the spring. And they call the morning star Venus in the springtime. Now, when you hear about, gosh, how do I get into all this? When you hear about wishing upon a star, when you wish upon a star, remember the word Venus? The word wish in the Latin is the word Venus. Remember the three wishes? We don't believe in demons here. The demons begin at Babel, at Babel, and a demon was a God man. That's what it was. When you watch one of these old Hercules movies, he is a man, isn't he? And he's a god. Hercules was Nimrod. That's all he was. He was Orion. The Hydra killer in the stars. He was the giant in the stars. And he was a god man. At Babel in Genesis 11, this is where the demon worship began, a god man. Well, where did god men start? Where did a god man begin? In the garden, when Eve said, when Satan said, and God doesn't mean what he says. He knows that when you eat of the tree, and that's where they started convoluting. You had two trees in the garden. You had the tree of life that bore fruit. And you had the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they begin to call this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they begin to call that the tree of life. That's what the pagans did. This was the tree of life when you know good from evil. Well, the God men started in the garden because, because Satan said, no, God doesn't mean what he meant. He'll know you'll be as gods. Little G-O-D. Of course, the word God is the word Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-Y-M. And it's the same word as the word theos in the Greek. We say theology, theos logos, means a study of the word of God. Theos is the word God. Elohim is the word God. And they both mean magistrate or judge. Well, did Eve become a God when she ate of the tree? Well, certainly she did. She said, God said, thou shalt not. And she said, I'll be the judge of that. It just means a judge or magistrate. She became a God slash man. That is what a demon is. Demon is the word D-A-I-M-O-N. And daemon comes from the root D-A-I-O. And that means to distribute fortunes. Well, the love of money is the root of all evil. Did she start distributing fortunes when she became a God man? Well, sure she did. She looked at the tree. John says, 1 John 2, 16, 17, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When you see demon, (coughs) you got to think of God man. (coughs) That's what a demon was. She saw the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, and that's what Eve saw in the tree. A good tree, good for food. It, would full, it was pleasant to the eye. Food would fulfill the lust of her flesh. Pride of life. It would make her wise. She could be proud. She could be proud of her wisdom. There are the three wishes. And when, when in Babel, when Nimrod began the Babylonian system... And they started the demon worship of the God-man. That was Hercules, Perseus, 
what did these guys do in mythology? They went into the underworld. This is the convolution of all. Hercules went on his 12 labors so he could take care of the people and distribute fortunes to the people, didn't he? Perseus, he was an Argos. Argos, of course, that's amazing. That word means idle. It means unemployed. And they all wanted to have... They, in Argos, they wanted to have the fortunes of this world. So Perseus goes into the underworld and he goes to the river Styx and he crosses the river Styx and goes into Hades and kills the Hydra and comes back to distribute fortunes to the people of Argos. Mythology is nothing but Adam and Eve worship of the garden. That's all it is. And when it was reinstituted at Babel, they reinstituted Adam and Eve worship. And when they began the worship of these, all that was is to disguise. When you get into Hercules and Perseus and Adonis and all the rest of these guys, that was a method of disguising man's desire to fulfill the flesh is all it was. So you get three wishes from a genie, don't you? And genie is the word gene comes from the word gene, and that is our makeup, or our being. And genos, we get the word genos, and that word means kinfolk, from the word gene. Kinfolk, and what the Jews called demons, the Arabs called genies. If you believe in demons, you've got to believe in genies. That's the three wishes. And what, what took us over there? Venus. Venus was said in mythology, this is the mess that Venus gets you into over here. The true morning star is not Venus. It's not you getting your wishes upon a star. Is it? No. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about what did Eve eat of over here? Fruit of the wrong tree the tree of life gives us the fruit doesn't it notice how all of this fits together and from the tree of life we get the fruit of righteousness don't we now let me see here so the morning star when you get into venus you get your, your wishes and that's the demon worship or the god men worship that's self-worship so they had to pollute this to get the mind off of what the real morning star was, didn't they? You have a convolution throughout. I've said these things, and I just, I, I hope you can understand what I'm trying to impart to you whenever I'm talking about God-men being demons. There's no such thing as Hercules and Adonis and all of this. If you believe in demons, in the first century, when they said, may the gods go with you, when you see an old Steve Reeves movie and he's Hercules and they're talking like this, and may the gods go with you, you know. The, what they said was, may the day I'm on. Demons go with you. In the first century, day I'm on and theos. Theos is the Greek word God. These two were interchangeable in the first century. So when they said, may the gods go with you, they meant may Hercules go with you and take care of you and distribute fortunes and protect you. May Adonis go with you. So if you believe in genies, you have to believe in demons. And what I'm getting at, Venus was a demon. Venus was just, Venus is not the goddess of love like Frank Avalon says. It's not true. Venus is the goddess of sexual Licentious promiscuity. That was the mother of Nimrod. And he was Orion in the stars. The true morning star. When I think of the morning star, I think of the seven stars. That's what I think of. The seven stars. One who is being sevened. And let's go, look, let's go over here and look. Let's see who the true morning star is. Go to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. 
excuse me, 22, not 21. 22. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine, in a, mine angel to testify unto you these things unto the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, this is Jesus, isn't it? This is not Venus. It's Jesus. First of all, they turned it into a female made it Semiramis, the mother of Nimrod. Sometimes she was his mother, sometimes she's his sister, and sometimes she was his wife. It's just crazy, the convolution. Venus is not the true morning star, as they say. And the morning star came out in the morning star. Morning star comes out in the spring. That's when we see it. What happens in the spring? Crops grow. Fertility. Among these people, they worshiped the tree goddess, which was the fertility god who resurrected in the spring, wasn't it? And that was Ishtar, or Easter. That's what it was. That was the spring goddess. Uh, Mr. Hislop tells us there was in the early church, there is no record whatsoever of the early church celebrating the resurrection of Jesus once a year in the spring. That, goodness, takes us to Mardi Gras, doesn't it? Yep, exactly. Well, gosh, it takes you to Saturnalia. I don't have time to go to all that. Of course, December 17th through 24th, that was the old feast of Saturn in the ancient world. And they said the sun was burning out. So on December the 21st, the winter solstice, longest nights of the year, they had to have this big party for seven days to the Saturn, the cold god, to bring the sun back. They said it was burning out. And some of the people in the pagan world said, well, our god is going to die, so he has to die uh, in the winter, in the depths of winter. So in Feb what we call February, the god would die. But, be but they knew he was going to die every year. Since they knew he was going to die every year, they said... What we have to do is party before he dies. So they had a carnival. And carnival means farewell to the flesh. That's what it means. It's an old ancient word to the flesh. Farewell to the flesh. So what they did, they took a period of time there where they would party and eat and have fun at their carnival because they said our God is dying on this particular day. And then they had the day, the day before the God had to be started to be mourned. They had a last day. It came on Tuesday. And they called it Fat Tuesday. That's a French word means Mardi Gras. And that word being Fat Tuesday, that was the last day of the carnival. And their God would die. And they would stuff and glut themselves at the Mardi Gras. And then they would go into mourning. And the Roman Catholics brought that in the church. They would go into mourning on Ash Wednesday. Wednesday. And then for 40 days... The Catholics brought that in. This was in paganism. They would mourn. And at the end of the 40 days, at the same time as the Passover when Jesus resurrected from the dead, their gods would resurrect in the spring, Addis, Adonis. And these were the tree and sun gods that would bring fertility. And I'm bringing all this out because... The morning star, they said, was Venus in the spring. And all of their fertility gods would raise up in the spring and bring forth fruit. Notice the similarity between the real truth and the lie. With every lie, there's a great element of truth. That's why when I say these Baptist preachers are lying... Just because they say saved and salvation and born again and use the terminology, it doesn't mean they're believers. Because among the pagan worship, 
They had the same terminology as we had in Christianity, as the Bible has. They simply took God's words and polluted them. We see that? They just polluted it all. The morning star is Christ. In the old ancient pagan world, even among the rabbis, they said that the morning star that came out in the spring, and it was supposed to be a cluster of seven, And Jesus has got seven stars in his right hand in the first chapter of Revelation, doesn't he? They said that the morning star was Pleiades. It was a cluster of Hmm. Thought I'd just stick that up there like that. The seven candlesticks is a picture of the seven stars, isn't it? If, you, if I had one made where that, if these arms here were equidistant, if they were all the same length coming out at the same space, what you're going to have. And on the Ark of Titus in 70 AD when Titus conquered Jerusalem, it's a three-dimensional, you can actually see it on here. And the floral pattern of the, of the candlesticks on the Ark of Titus, I'll raise some of this. The floral pattern is that's the floral pattern right there. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It is a hexagon shape. In the floral pattern. Gosh, I don't need to really go into that. That takes too long. That's the eyes of the Lord. That's, uh... Now, the rabbi said that David carried menorah, the seven candlesticks on his shield. The rabbi said this is what he had on his shield. That when they went out to battle, David had whatever kind of shield he had, he had the seven candlesticks on it. And as long as David was obedient, that fear struck into the people's hearts when they saw that. This right here, we call Star of David. They called Megan David. Megan means shield. Shield of David. If David carried the menorah on his shield, and this is called shield of David, I believe that's what he had. That's the candlesticks right there. Well, if that's the seven stars, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Angel is the word angelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S. means messenger. That has to do with the oil in the lamps, doesn't it? That's the oil inside. That's the message. The oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. That We are these candlesticks right here. And he calls each one of these churches a candlestick, doesn't he? Doesn't he call them that? Let me read something to you out of my McClinic and Strong on the candlestick. I've got a whole bunch on it. But this is out of McClinic and Strong. It's the very end of the... In fact, that the golden candelabrum was expressly made after the pattern shown in the mount... Many have endeavored to find a symbolical meaning in all of its ornaments, especially mire and bar. Generally, it was a type of preaching. Huh? Did y'all hear that? The candlesticks was a type of preaching to the rabbis. Well, it was a type of preaching to the Jews. And the candlesticks are the church. And the angels are a picture of the angelos. The message is a picture of the oil. The candlesticks have always been preaching, hasn't it? So when we preach truth, preach truth, that produces fruit of the Spirit, doesn't it? That produces fruit. This was considered a tree by the Jews. Let me finish reading that. We must, 
when our Lord cried, I am the light of the world in John 8 and 12. Well, let me back up. Similarly, when they said it was a type of preaching or of the light of the law, similarly, candlesticks are elsewhere made types of the spirit of the church of witnesses. You remember the two witnesses over in Revelation 11? The two witnesses were the two candlesticks, right? Quoted from Zechariah, the fourth chapter, those last few verses. And the scripture says, these two candlesticks are the two anointed of the Lord that stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. There were two anointed in the Old Testament. That was the priest and the king, wasn't it? Priest and king were the two that were anointed in the Old Testament with oil. And now we are priests and kings. Therefore, we are the candlesticks. Aren't we? Wait a minute. I think verse 20 of Revelation 1 says that, doesn't it? The seven candlesticks are the seven churches of Asia. It sounds funny to say the candlesticks are the church out of the context of Revelation 1.20. And then you say, oh yeah, well I think we ought to learn that. The seven candlesticks are this. So this is the church. And the church produces the fruit of the Spirit. They had, they had knops and they had blossoms. This is not made correctly. They had little blossoms under these, and blossoms produced fruit. And they said that this candlestick produced fruit. This is the tree of life right here. I think the church is the tree of life, isn't it? Huh? Is the church, is Jerusalem the church? Hebrews twelve twenty two. we are the church of the firstborn. We're Mount Zion. If we're the church of the firstborn... That's heavenly Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is our mother, isn't it? Huh? In the fourth chapter of Galatians. Uh, in Galatians. Well, if that's our mother, then our mother is the church. And when we honor our mother, what is she called over in Proverbs, the third chapter? Look what our mother is called in Proverbs, the third chapter. Trying to put all this together is, I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just trying to say, all of these things go together. Huh? Proverbs 3. <laughs> That's our mother, isn't it? Huh? Gosh, there's so many places I need to go here. Chapter 3, verse 1, my son, when God says through Solomon, my son, forget not my law, but let my, thine heart keep my commandments. Boy, verse 2 is so important. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. When we honor our mother and father, that's the first commandment with promise. And what do we, what's the promise when we honor our mother and father? We'll look at it in Exodus, the 20th chapter. Exodus 20. Exodus 20. Exodus 20th chapter. We're still talking about the morning star, aren't we? The morning star is the seven stars. Exodus, the 20th chapter, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, does this mean you got a cursing father... He gets drunk. You're to let him get by with his heathenism. No. Who is our father? God. And who is our mother? Jerusalem. I'm not saying dishonor your literal parents. Besides that, the word honor is in the Greek is the word T-I-M-E. It looks like time. 
It's pronounced time. It means to place a value upon. Well, are you valuing your parents if you allow them to curse in your house or get drunk or do things they shouldn't be doing? The best, the most value you could put upon your parent is say, Mom, I won't allow that. You're going to have to stop what you're doing. If you have any value at all, you will correct them. Use your rabdos. Use your rabdos, that's right. And you'll rule them. Now, back to Proverbs 3. Remember, the first commandment with promise, you have to connect Exodus 20 and 12 with Proverbs 3 and 2. When he says, my son, that's a father talking to a son, isn't it? Our father is God, isn't it? When you back up to the first chapter, the first chapter in verse 8, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake the not the law of thy mother. He's not talking about listen to an unbelieving mother and father that are your parents. That's not what he's talking about. I had a very tyrannical father. He was a tyrant, a bully, bullied everybody. And boy, I was so confused by these things. Honor thy father and thy mother when I was a kid. And my father, you honor me. I'll cuss if I want to. You know, that's not honor at all. The best thing you can do is make your, if you are the son or the daughter and your parents are acting up, the, the most honorable thing you can do is make them behave themselves when they're around you. Huh? Yeah, we'll get to that too. And he says, look here. <clears throat> In verse, he says, length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Now let's go down here to verse 11. My son, this is a father talking to his son, isn't it? Our father's God. And I like the word father. In the Hebrew, it's the word ab. It means, that's the word, Abba, it means daddy. Ab is the word father, and it means to decide or desire. That's predestination. God decides who belongs to him. He decides what's right and wrong in your life. Our father is God. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Wisdom and understanding. Wisdom and understanding. When you understand and you have wisdom, you produce the fruit of the Spirit, don't you? Huh? Don't you do that? I'm not going to go into that right now. But you produce the fruit of the Spirit when you have fruit. Therefore, wisdom and understanding is our mother. Let's look at it. What did Jesus say who his mother was in the second chapter of Mark? My mother and my brother and my sisters are those who do the will of the Father. Didn't he say that? This is abstract terminology. It's idiomatic. That's the way they talked. And if you don't learn this, you'll miss the whole thing. Now, he's talking about happy is the man that gets wisdom and understanding, right? Keep wisdom and understanding in mind. For the merchandise of it, what is it referring to? Wisdom, wisdom and understanding is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She, who is she talking about? Wisdom and understanding. She is more precious than rubies. I wonder who she is going to be. It's going to be our mother, isn't it? She is more precious than rubies. And all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand. The same thing he said when you honor your father in verse 2, isn't it? Length of days and long life and peace. That's Exodus 20 and 12. Length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. Her. Feminine pronoun. 
her ways. Not it. Wisdom and understanding is not an it. Wisdom and understanding is her. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life. There you are to the tree of life. She is the candlesticks. That's the church, isn't it? Huh? And what does the tree of life in the garden produce? It produces the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit. It produces fruit. Huh? What? Fruit. That's right. Doesn't it? Now notice this, verse 18. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold on her. And happy is everyone that retains her. Notice this is feminine gender pronoun. Her, not it. Wisdom and, un- wisdom and understanding is her. And she is a tree of life. But what identifies her as our mother is verse 16. Length of days is in her right hand. Length of days, that's a picture of our mother, Jerusalem, the church. The church is the tree of life, isn't it? If our mother is the tree of life, look here. Let me erase this. All right. This is all, I I don't know if y'all know I'm doing this to you, but Mike knows it. I'm teaching you some algebra without telling you it's algebra. That's what I'm doing. This is all algebra that I'm talking to you. Now, if the tree of life, of life, length of days, length of days is in her hand, in hand, And and when you honor your mother, honor mother, long life is the, is is honoring your mother. Then, if we can show that the mother is is the church. Not like the Catholics say mother church. Our mother are those who do the will of the father. Then the church is the tree of life, isn't it? Huh? Things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. Let's go over here. Let's go over here to Galatians, the fourth chapter. Galatians, the fourth chapter. And we're still talking about the morning star, aren't we? The morning star was the Pleiades, the seven stars. How much time do I have, Mike? I'm not getting to all this. I ain't got time. Let's quit. Okay, Galatians. Galatians. Fourth chapter. Well, let's go to Ephesians first. Ephesians, the sixth chapter. And then I'll go back to Galatians 4. Ephesians, the fifth, sixth chapter. Mm. Verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord only. Don't obey your parents when they tell you to steal. Go get them some beer at the store. Pick me up a pack of cigarettes. That's not obeying your parents in the Lord. How many of us have had this stuff thrown at us from the time we were a child? You honor me. I'm your father, blankety blank. That's not what that's talking about. And I'm not saying, if you'll notice, he goes from parent to father and mother. He goes from parent in verse 1 to father and mother in verse 2. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What is the promise? Long life. If we honor God our Father... Honor God our Father. And we all, if we honor our mother, which is the tree of life, which is wisdom and understanding, which 
which produces the fruit of the Spirit, then we have eternal life, don't we? That's what this is talking about. It's not talking about let your mother and father get by with murder. I had to correct my father real hard when he would come to my house because he'd let loose and lose his temper and start cursing people. And I had to go stand over him and say, just like he was eight years old, and say, you, don't, you won't talk like that in this house. Do you understand me? That was the most thing I could do honorable to him is make him behave himself. I'm not trying to just talk bad about my father. The man was a tyrant, a bully. He bullied everybody except me. Asa yeah, Asa honored his mother. That's right. Thank you, Billy. Asa was the king of Judah, and she and his mother had a had a Ashtaroth, a tree goddess that she kept. And Asa said, "Boop, you're off the throne, mom, and so is your tree god." God said, "This is a righteous man. He don't let his mother get by with anything." Yep. Now look here: honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now go back here to Galatians four. Verse 22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by bondmaid, the other by free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, that's Hagar. But he of the free woman, Sarah, was by promise, which things are an allegory. This is a picture. God painted this picture with the lives of people in the Old Testament. For these are the two covenants, one from the Mount Sinai, which gendered to bondage. One is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children, with her children. This mother, Jerusalem, is a her. It's the same her as wisdom and understanding in Proverbs, the third chapter. This is the tree of life, isn't it? If the mother, if the wisdom and understanding is the tree of life of the Old Testament, that's the same her. And wisdom and understanding comes from Jerusalem, doesn't it? And where do we get it, wisdom and understanding from Jerusalem? From the Ark of the Covenant, the law is written on tables of stone. Now we are heavenly Jerusalem, the church. We are Jerusalem, the church. Hebrews 12, 22, the church of the firstborn. Therefore, if Jerusalem, and let's finish reading here. But Jerusalem, which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. So if we honor Jerusalem, how, what is it we're doing honoring Jerusalem? That's the church, isn't it? That's our mother. Our mother and our brothers and sisters are those who do the will of the Father, isn't it? And if we honor that, if the church is Jerusalem and the church is our mother, and when you honor your mother, long life, and the tree of life produces length, is in her hand, then the tree of life is our mother, our mother is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the church. The church is the tree of life, isn't it? And it produces fruit. Wait a minute. This was a tree. This was a tree. It had flowers and buds and it bloomed. Figuratively, they said, and it produced fruit. But wait a minute. I think we've already discovered that the church is the candlesticks, haven't we? That's what Revelation one twenty says, that the church, the seven churches are the seven candlesticks. And the, the seven the church, when a man is sevened, he starts producing fruit to God, doesn't he? I've run out of time, but I'm not. I really want to tie some of these things together. I want to. I, I've gone through this one time. I'm going to come back next week. 
and really see if I can't. All these things are equal. I was going to put Jerusalem, tree of life, tree of life, church, seven candlesticks. And it goes on and all these are equal to each other. So whenever you see one of them, you see the rest. Now, when we're talking about tree of life. We're talking about the fruits. I'm going to come back and go more into the Pleiades. The Pleiades was the seven stars. Remember, remember, Jesus has seven stars in his right hand. You cannot separate that from the Pleiades of the Old Testament. When the Lord tells Job, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? The rabbi said that the Pleiades, the seven stars, the original seven stars, the seven stars is the church, isn't it? That's our mother. The, the rabbi said the original Pleiades, and boy, when you get to studying Jewish thought, it's, just, it, it's astounding. They said that the Pleiades caused the fruits to come out on the, in the springtime. Well, the pagans polluted it and said that's Venus. Or Easter. That's right. I've run out of time and I'm just getting started in this. I want to be more extensive on this morning star than I ever have. I've rushed through it in lessons. And I feel like I've halfway given it to you in a lot of the lessons. I really want you to see the tree of life is our mother. It is the candlesticks. It is the cross. It is the church. It's the body of Christ that produces the fruit of the Spirit. And what they did is they convoluted the two trees. And they started calling the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the tree of life. But I think they call good evil and evil good according to Isaiah 5, don't they? they can call, they're going to call evil good, good evil. They're going to put sweet for bitter, bitter for sweet. And they're going to put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for the tree of life. And that's what the world thinks. Fulfill the flesh and you got life. No, you've got death. That's what you've got. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. What a God you are to paint these kinds of abstract pictures and let us see what they are. Sometimes it overwhelms me, Lord, that you would allow us to see these things. Thank you, God. We praise you for choosing us and opening our hearts to see this. I don't know what to even say when I pray to you. God, open up my heart and eyes to see much more than I'm even seeing now. Because, God, I believe there is just an unfathomable riches of your glories in this word that we haven't even tapped, Lord. Open my eyes to see. And help me to impart it to these elect so they'll see it. And we'll praise you for everything. In Christ's name, amen.